Good morning. Welcome to American Reformed Church. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We gather in this space called by the one who knows us, who upholds us, and who loves us. Let's begin worship today by rising and singing praise to the Lord, hymn number 77. Children of God, we know the peace that passes all understanding. Friends, the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Please take a moment to share that peace with those around you. to be in a right relationship with God, but in our humanity, we fall short every single day. But the good news comes from John 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
Please join me in the prayer of confession. Loving God, we confess that there is brokenness in our lives, deep valleys that separate us from one another and from you. We confess that too often we are critical rather than kind, that we focus on serving ourselves rather than those in need, that we embrace your forgiveness but are slow to forgive others. In the midst of this brokenness, we long for the wholeness you have called us to. Mend us, we pray. Have mercy upon us for the wrongs we have done. Help us to follow in the footsteps of Jesus and fill us with your love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Friends, because of God's grace, we are forgiven people. Go out and live in the light of that forgiveness. Let's rise now to sing our song of assurance, hymn number 477, Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. Good morning. 
American Reformed Church. For those of you who may not know me already, my name is Missy Doctor, and I am an ordained specialized minister in the RCA. I also serve as one of two chaplains for Hope Haven, an agency that serves people with disabilities and mental illness, primarily in the tri-state area of Iowa, Minnesota, and South Dakota. But our impact extends beyond that as we distribute wheelchairs throughout the world through our Hope Haven International Ministries. My primary service area is the east side of our agency. So Emmitsburg, Esterville, Storm Lake, Spirit Lake, Spencer. So I feel like I live in my car, but I actually live in Orange City with my husband Ryan and our son Christian, who is a freshman at MOC Floyd Valley. And at some points and times during the year, our daughters, Ariana and Bianca, are also there. Um, they are sophomores at the University of Sioux Falls and the University of Iowa, respectively. And having had the opportunity to preach here before, I am grateful to be back one more time before you welcome your new pastor. And I want you to know that I'm so excited for you and for him and his family and for the season of ministry that is upcoming for you all here at American Reformed Church. But without further ado, we're going to get to today's message, which is titled Life of Light. And it comes from the book of Ephesians. And in it, we're going to be focusing on who God is, what God does, and what that means for us, God's people. But first, let's go to God in prayer. Dear God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be pleasing to you our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. So I invite you to turn with me to Ephesians. It would be great if you left it open, too, if you have it in front of you. We're going to be starting at chapter 5, verse 1. It will also be on the screen if you prefer to engage it that way. I will be reading from the NSRV, the New Revised Standard Version, but if you have a different version in front of you, that's okay. Just let it serve to offer you a richer understanding of the passage. Now hear these words from the Apostle Paul, inspired by God. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. And live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But fornication and impurity of any kind or greed must not even be mentioned among you, as is proper among saints. Entirely out of place is obscene, silly, and vulgar talk. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. Be sure of this, that no fornicator or impure person or one who is greedy, that is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be associated with them. For once you were in darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, for it is shameful even to mention such what such people do secretly but everything exposed to the light becomes visible for everything that becomes visible is light therefore it says sleeper awake arise from the dead 
and Christ will shine on you. Church, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So before we exegete the 14 verses we just read, it is evident that we need to consider their connection to the passage prior. And it is evident because chapter 5, verse 1, starts with the word, therefore. And it's important for us to understand what the therefore is there for. So if we turn back to chapter 4, this is one of the reasons why I encourage you to keep your Bible open. We are reminded of the call of Christ, of the transition from the old life to the new life. Because of Christ and his call. It's because of that transition that chapter 5 begins with the word, therefore. Essentially, Paul is saying that the new life results in new rules for living that are sourced by the same one that calls us to it. Now, I know that's on your screen, but it is worth repeating, so let me say it again. The new life results in new rules for living that are sourced by the same one that is Christ that calls us to it. Now, I want to acknowledge that the word rules might be a bit of a trigger for some of us. Rules often come with a negative connotation. They get a bad rap for being unfun, freedom-inhibiting killjoys. And they can be. When imposed by the wrong person for the wrong reason. And in order to understand the person and the reason behind the new rules for a new way of living imposed on the believer, I invite you to take a closer look with me at verses 1 and 2. Therefore, be imitators of God As beloved children, and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Now, aside from the word and, which is mentioned several times in that passage, what root word is mentioned three times? Audience participation time, what is it? Shout it out. Love, yes. Love. The root word mentioned multiple times in these couple of verses is love. Love is the primary ingredient of rules that are both beneficial and life giving. I once heard an analogy for God's rules that likened them to a guardrail on a dangerous road. It is not meant to inhibit freedom. It is meant, actually, to create protected freedom. Have you ever been to the mountains, the Grand Rocky Mountains? Anyone? Yeah, I see some nodding. And if so, you've probably seen many of these guardrails, particularly as you were traveling hairpin turns along steep cliffs. And my guess is that regardless of your position in the car, whether you were the driver or the passenger, rather than those guardrails making you feel trapped, they made you feel safe, right? So it is with God's rules, the guardrails of the Christian life. Because of God's love for us, He sent his son to give us a model to establish the rules or the guardrails for the new life to which he has called us. So in our time together today, I'm going to offer you three sort of prerequisites or what I call guiding principles for a life that imitates Christ. Okay? So first, in order to imitate Christ, we must belong to Christ. There is evidence for our belonging to Christ, again, in verses 1 and 2. In verse 1, we are called beloved children. That communicates belonging, right? Now, as I said in my introduction, 
My husband Ryan and I have three children. They belong to us. I mean, ultimately, they belong to God. They were his, they are his, they will forever be his. But they belong to us. They are also ours. You know how I know this? (laughs) There's a real foolproof way. It's because we are sending money out the door with them every day. Sometimes multiple times a day. It's five bucks here, it's 50 bucks there, it's $150 somewhere else. And if you are in the season of raising teens and preteens, you know that this is true. If you survived that season and you still have means to sustain your own life and well being, congratulations. Do not underestimate the inspiration you are to those of us still in the midst of it. And if that season is still coming for you, I don't know. Maybe plant a money tree. (laughs) Better yet, just double down in savings so that you're prepared because that season is coming. But in all seriousness, we know that our children belong to us because we are responsible for them. Whether that involves the hemorrhaging of our pocketbooks or the teaching of life skills that will give them the tools to eventually be self-sustaining adults who are responsible for themselves and then maybe even for their families and or companies, or communities, or churches. It is because our children belong to us, and because we are responsible for them, that we invest in them. We care for them. We love them differently, with more breadth and more depth than those who do not belong to us. And so it is with God. Because we belong to God's family, we have been invested in and cared for and loved differently with more breadth and more depth than those who do not belong to the family of God. We have been given the perfect model, a share in the inheritance keys to the eternal kingdom. And it is because of that that we should be compelled to a new and different life. So the first is we must belong to Christ. Second, in order to imitate Christ, we must be in relationship with Christ. So here I I want to ask you to think about your relationships with other people. In fact, think about the relationship that you have with the person that you are closest to. Maybe it's a spouse, or a sibling, or a childhood friend. Whoever it is, picture that person in your mind's eye. And then think about what it took for you to build a relationship with that person and also to maintain it. How does time factor into your relationship with that other person? What about communication? Listen up, both talking and listening. What about trust, dependability, vulnerability? All of these things are elements of a personal relationship. And if done well, they make for a good one, maybe even a great one. After all, your relationship with your childhood friend was built on time, right? Time spent together exploring and learning and figuring out life. Have you ever considered how successful your relationship with your sibling would be if you never communicated? Never shared celebrations and struggles related to both self and family? 
How well would your relationship with your spouse be going? If you are not able to trust them to follow through with their commitments to you or depend on them to contribute to the family and household responsibilities or be vulnerable with them about your thoughts and your feelings in your dreams. I don't doubt that as you think of these scenarios, it's pretty clear that the absence of these elements could create a less than favorable outcome for your relationships with the people you care about most. There is a difference between knowing about a person or thing and actually knowing that person or thing. And to further explain the difference, I'm reminded of a conversation that Ryan and I had many years ago and many times <laughs> regarding sports teams. Now, I'll admit that he has mellowed a lot <laughs> over the years. But at that point of our relationship, he was beyond passionate about his sports teams. Beyond. <laughs> Our personal weekend schedules revolved around the timing of his team's games. And I knew that he was largely off limits for any conversation or activity during the time that they aired. Since I was less passionate about sports at the time, in general, and did not care one iota about some of his teams, let's just say there were frequent conversations, sometimes conversations that would qualify as heated moments of fellowship. <laughs> it happened a lot in those early days as we attempted to understand each other and come to some sort of sports viewing agreement that we could both live with. I can recall a particular conversation in which I tried to explain to Ryan that I had an allegiance to the Hawkeyes because there was a level of personal relationship there, whereas I had no level of personal relationship with the Vikings, and therefore could not possibly get to the same level of devotion about them that he did. His response was, you know Randy Moss, which dates the conversation. And I said, um, no, my dear, I do not, actually. <laughs> sure, I've seen him from the other side of my TV screen, but I've not had a face-to-face -face interaction with him. I haven't sat in class with the Vikings players like I have with the Hawkeye players. I have not given one penny of my personal finances to the Vikings program, but thousands of dollars to the University of Iowa. There's a difference in knowing about the Vikings and knowing the Hawkeyes. There's a difference between knowing about someone or something and actually knowing that person or thing. The elements of trust and communication and time, among other things, need to be present in our relationships with people. They need to be all the more present in our relationships with God. These are the things that move us from a place of knowing about God to truly knowing God. After all, God knows us better than we even know ourselves. So if we feel far from God, as we're prone to do as humans, if we feel like we do not truly know God, it's on us to move towards the one who is always there, always pursuing us. So to recap, we must belong to Christ. We must be in relationship with Christ. Third and finally, in order to imitate Christ, we must be followers of Christ. Though it is not possible to effectively follow him unless we 
truly know him personally and intimately, I do not believe that it is possible to truly know him and not also be compelled to follow him. So what exactly does it mean to follow Christ? Well, remember how I've referred to Jesus as the model for the new life to which we have been called. He provides the template for Christian living. So put simply, not as simple to do, we are to imitate his ways. And Ephesians 5 provides us with more specific guidelines. In this passage, we are instructed to refrain from even mentioning things related to fornication, impurity, or greed, or participating in obscene, silly, or vulgar talk. We are told that idolatry has no place in the kingdom of God. We are cautioned even about using empty words and associating with deceit and disobedience. But the guidelines are not just a list of don'ts. They're a list of do's as well. Do be thankful. Do be fruitful. Do what is good and right and true. Do what is pleasing to the Lord. Perhaps the most important theme, though, is to recognize the truth of verse 8. For once you were in darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of light. Church, as children of light, we are called to live both in and out of that light. We are called to shine that light into the darkest corners of the world and even to expose the darkest corners of our own hearts. The powers of darkness become powerless when exposed to the light. In closing, I want to share a fictional story told by a well-known pastor and author from Texas in one of his books. It's Max Lucado's story, and God came near, if you're interested. But I want to share it because I think it illustrates very well the need to understand the darkness from which we came and the temptation that we may feel to stay there rather than to be the children of light which we are called to be. The story is about a bunch of candles that were in a storage closet. And it goes like this. One night, there was an electrical storm. And the electricity in the house went out. So the homeowner went to the candles to get them to provide light during the darkness. But the candles, which could talk, because of course candles could talk in a fictional story, all had excuses for why they couldn't leave the closet and why they couldn't give off light. One said, it needed more preparation. She didn't want to make mistakes when she finally was sent to light a room, and so she was studying to be the best candle she could be. She said she was in a great study on wind resistance, had just listened to a series on wick buildup and conservation, and was getting ready to read a best-selling book on flame display called Waxing Eloquently. The second candle claimed to be busy meditating. He said that he was meditating on the importance of light, and he couldn't be disturbed because it was so enlightening. A third claimed that he wasn't stable enough and had to get his life together before he tried to light any rooms. He said his main problem was that he had a short temper, and people thought he was a hothead. The fourth candle said that while she would like to help, lighting the darkness wasn't really her gift. She was a singer, 
And her responsibility was to encourage the other candles so that they could go out and light the darkness. And to reveal her gift, she immediately launched into a beautiful rendition of this little light of mine. And all the other candles began to sing as well. And nothing the owner could do could stop them. When he asked his wife where she picked up the candles, she said, Oh, they're church candles. Remember that church that closed down across town? I got them there. No wonder the church across town closed down. How tragic for the candles not to fulfill their purpose. And how much more tragic for us not to fulfill our purpose as children of light. Here's where it gets real. In our humanity, if we're really honest with ourselves, aren't we more prone to be like those candles? Sometimes shining our light, the light of Christ, at certain times and in certain spaces, but not in others. If we were really honest with ourselves, wouldn't we have to admit that we often shine the light of Christ at church on Sunday morning, but less often under the lights of the Friday night football game, during Bible study, but not as we're hurried and waiting in the long line at the grocery store. When traveling overseas for a mission project, but not when cut off by the obnoxious driver on our way to work. I'll say it again. In our humanity, we are prone to shine our light, the light of Christ, in certain times and in certain spaces, but not in others. What's the consequence? <laughs> well, let's consider what would happen if the actual lights in our lives function similarly. What if the headlights on your car suddenly stopped working during your nighttime road trip? What if the runway lights went dark just as your plane was landing? What if the operating room lights flickered as your doctor was performing an intricate life-saving procedure on you? The outcome would be catastrophic. And here's the truth. If we refuse to shine our Christ-infused lights, or we turn them on and off situationally, it is equally, maybe more so, catastrophic for the kingdom. Our communities, our world, are dependent on us God's beloved children, bearers of Christ's light, to shine it brightly. Those that are still in darkness as we once were do not know what they are missing unless we show them the love of Christ by shining his light. Which is why our passage for today ends with, Sleeper, awake. Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Church, this is not a message for someone else. It is for us. For those of us who belong to Christ, who are in relationship with Christ, and who are doing our best to faithfully follow Christ. We must heed the command to awake from our sleepy states, to rise from our deadened dreams, and to be filled with the light of Christ so that it emulates from us to all that we come in contact with. Christ has called us, and our communities, and our world are counting on us to communicate Christ's love by shining his light brightly and boldly. 
Let's pray. God, first and foremost, we thank you for sending your son Jesus, the light of the world, as the perfect model for the new life to which you have called us. Lord, help us to faithfully and confidently shine your light to all within our circles of influence at all times. And it is in Jesus' most precious and holy name that we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you, Missy, for giving us a deeper understanding of God's love for us and how we can live that out in our own lives. Thank you for being here. Friends, please pray with me. Loving God, we have so much to be grateful for. We thank you for the simple joys of everyday life, for friends and family, for times of work, rest, and play, for the indescribable beauty of your creation. We thank you for American Reformed Church and especially for Pastor Bryce, who has answered the call to be our new shepherd. We pray that we will continue to be people of acceptance, grace, wisdom, and love, open to change, and willing to serve. Loving God, we know you are a God of peace. And so we pray for places where conflict reigns, for those in difficult relationships, for victims of domestic violence, for innocent people who have lost homes and loved ones due to the brutality of war. Lord, heal your world, we pray, and help us to be bearers of your peace. Loving God, we know you are a God of justice, and so we pray for marginalized people everywhere, for those living in poverty, for those who have been belittled, excluded, or persecuted, simply for living their lives as the people you have created them to be. Open our eyes, Lord, to the injustices of this world and fill us with the courage to act. Loving God, we know you are a God of compassion. And so we pray for our people in our church, in our community, and in the greater, greater world who are suffering. For those who are sick in body, mind, or spirit. For those who have lost loved ones. For the helpless and the hopeless. Draw near, O oh God. Open our hearts to the brokenhearted and nudge us to reach out with kindness and mercy. We pray all of these things in the name of Christ, and we echo the prayer that you taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Because of God's generosity to us, we give our offerings of thanks to further God's kingdom here on earth. Your offerings may be placed in the box in the back. Um, they may also be mailed to the church office, or you can give online. So please rise and sing the doxology as our offerings are brought forward.
Our song of response is hymn number 78, O God, Our Help in Ages Past. Following the benediction, please remain standing for the sending song. American Reformed Church, it has been a joy to be with you again. I will be praying for you as you invite in the next season with Pastor Bryce. But before you go, I want to offer you this blessing. Church, once you were in darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of the light, shining the light of Christ to everyone and everything around you. Go from this place in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.